Hey, hey, hey. We got sound. I don't even know if I need to wear my headphones. Hey, hey, hey. It's Fat Albert. That was a cartoon. The Cosby Kids, I think. Mm-hmm. Was uh, when I was growing up. Fat Albert. Different show. Fat Albert. And the Cosby Kids, maybe. I can't remember. So that was just a flashback for me. And I was going to roll a cigarette as well. So I pushed play, record on the uh, podcast a little bit early. I think I can actually edit on YouTube. So maybe I'll just cut out this first little bit. That's a good idea. So what I might do, just while I get ready, is I'm going to put on a some music. One second. Hold tight, my friends. We're going to get edited out. My computer has uh, suddenly just frozen up. Technology. Yeah, let's play some liquid drum and bass. All right. Welcome to Queens and Kings. Creating our, creating and dreaming our fairy kingdoms for the future of the world. Thank you. 
They might love these. It's a pleasure to have you. I've got uh, computer issues. Look at my lovely flowing locks. I washed my hair today. Special occasion. We have a... Oh, I better turn this music down. Hello, hello. Welcome to Queens and Kings. Dreaming and creating our fairy kingdoms where we talk about new societies and ways to live for the future. And I'm Bo. I just wash my hair. So look at it. It's looking very, very soft and... <laughs> I, I when I put the shampoo in I saw all the dirt come out and I was like I, I need to wash my hair more often <laughs> yeah so this is where we create dream new worlds and there's to dream a new world or a new society it needs got to talk about many different things from the design of the the city or the village or the, or the community to how it's structured how how is the authority structured and what rules do you put in place what what are you trying to achieve in your community and that's that's one thing we've been talking about is uh, the, the the ideal or the need or the one of the like most important factors for any community is harmony. 
and then how do you achieve that, that said harmony? Because I think that's why majority of us are scared to move into like communities where we like actually commune together. You know, not suburban developments where you're in your little house and you got your fence and but where you're actually eating together or preparing food together or working together. Uh, just doing more things together, communing and so it forms a, a a kinship. I think you 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 have kin. Your everyone is your family, just extended family, and we all rely on each other to 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 build to build a harmonious community. And we're all equally as important as each and every other person. And we all have our roles. And the intention is harmonious living together. Harmony and joy. And trust. And love. These, these emotions that bring to people together. And so you create a harmonious community. So, but then that can be scaled to village, to town, to city. Like, I, I feel that you can. I obviously haven't tried it. The only way to know for sure is to do it, to actually do it. But I have had some experience the last few years running a community of Mindful Earth. And have learnt uh, a lot about the importance of having the harmony that harmony is is the most important thing actually you could have the most beautiful spaces and the most wealth uh, and abundance but if you don't have that harmony and like kinship between you between your people it you it's not like if you've you've all got a common purpose, and that is the harmony of the the village, like that's the sort of priority we should put when we when we have a say, hey, let's all live together. What? Do we, how do we do this? And so, when that's your focus, harmony, then you can start setting in. Uh, focus points so you can build that harmony w amongst the people and make sure that they're happy and so yeah that's the basic building block what is it it's we want s trust for our people we want to trust each other we want to love each other we want to care for each other we want to see each other as as family and I, I guess that's what like if I think of Australia and the the idea of my, my national, my being Australian, that national sort of like a form of patriotism, I'm proud to be Australian in many ways. Not every way, but a lot of ways. I love the Australian culture. So yeah, we have we have some good qualities that I'm proud of. So yeah, I have when I see an Australian and I'm overseas and it's sort of like this mateship. There's a form of mateship there, kinship, we're kin. The same same from the same country. And you sort of see that when you go like not so much Australians, like oh you're from the same town or uh I often think of uh, what come to mind is the Scots and their hello mango how are you uh, uh, the Scots with the clans like they they were quite a powerful the clans and I only know a little bit about how they were structured but yeah they were they were like they that's how they grouped people together in their kin the kin kin 
but they all looked after each other and they supported each other and they had a, they had wise people and they had uh, yeah it's a full range of people that were all part of the same clan same kin and that building that again is what I'm talking about building that strength in community and I feel now is there's never ever been a better time for us to go back into these like structured spaces where we where we learn to commune again and connect and having that experience with mindful earth I've seen that it's possible and I think that's the biggest one like I didn't really actually know what what I'm what was possible I had no idea because community was all new to me and but what I realized and what I learned was that it's once you get used to being in a community with people around all the time it's it's uh feels normal and it's a nice it's nice to have people around that you connect with that you that we that you um yeah that they're like brothers and sisters and they're kin it's like to f to to grow with a total stranger to get to know them and then for them to be your friends and then they become your kin it's like it's very powerful and it feels and it's very normal i think we just naturally we do gravitate towards our our tribes uh yeah and i think that is well i know that the reason is is because we are social beings like if you we are a species just like the the chimpanzees and the cats and we all have our characteristics and our characteristics are that we commune with each other <laughs> we're very social animals we have many we that's where we thrive is in socializing with like-minded people connecting with people and being yourself like this is our natural state is what i've seen and it's possible to have large amount of people having a good time together and living together and i don't think that number can needs to be have a limit you've just got to have the right society and the right design and the right priorities for your society to flourish and i guess that's always the aim of every government you hope like that's that's what that's the aim to look after the people but you come up with the problem of who's who's making the decisions and who's who's qualified to make those decisions and this is i think one of the areas that we've like fallen down over the last with the with democracy is just not having the right leaders in place the right leaders to guide our society for the people and now we've reached this point where the leaders that we elect only get to those positions because they're the wrong type of people <laughs> i think that's sort of where we're at now uh it's difficult to get into a position as a politician to have any authority or to get a voice i guess unless you're a very special human which i dream about many of those very special humans like coming up through the ranks now and and 
coming maybe into politics from different angles where they maybe missed out on that political grooming place and they're more free and they got th- free minded they're free minded and uh, yeah w- they're the ones I hope for for to arrive but I believe the system is sort of set up to be a, to pick and choose the people that you want to be you know making the representing the people yeah it's a interesting system and I always wondered why like I I don't know a lot about Australian politics but one interesting thing is that the, the we built a city called Canberra between Sydney and Melbourne must have cost a fortune, uh, maybe a hundred years, a hundred and fifty years ago. It was all properly designed, and that's where Parliament House is, and that's where all the politicians live. They live in the, in one city. But the the thing is that it's very it's separate from the people, Canberra. Like it's different, and it doesn't have the true story of what's going on in Australia and I think we, we'd be way better if all our bureaucrats were mixed in amongst the rest of the Australians so then they would understand what's going on here but if you're isolated in your own little city it's a bit easier to miss the Miss the mark. Mm. That's what. Uh, speaking of miss the mark, I heard Osho say once that sin, sin, S I N. So that's the stuff you do that's not with God. Sin means to miss the target in uh, Sanskrit, possibly. So, to miss the target. So, when you're hitting the target, you're being with God. And my understanding of being with God is to be loving and kind and doing good deeds and following the Ten Commandments and doing just doing the common sense, <laughs> being... Loving your all beings, loving all beings. And so if you're deviating from that, then that is called sin. And then that's what you get. By sinning, you get karma. And karma is just a, a repercussion of the sin that you were performing or acting or doing. And it's purely just the way the universe works. This has become my belief that you follow the light, you follow good, good, exactly what the Bible says and every other religion actually <laughs> do good and I, I believe that's the actual nat- the what the universe would prefer is that creation love energy that's what it's seeking in all of us but then there is that dark energy that tries to stop it and if you want to think of it as if we're in a video game like the dark energy is simply the difficulty level like if you if you didn't have that dark energy everything would be light everything would be great and beautiful and perfect and then it would be kind of be boring so you put some difficulty into onto the adventure and that's that the dark energy which is trying to stop 
us all evolving higher in consciousness, gaining more wisdom, opening our eyes more, enlightening us, filling us with light, information, knowledge. That's what the universe wants. And if you deviate from that path, then you get karma. And I don't know much about how long does karma st- hang around for. Or but the, the Hindus say that it hangs around for lives, possibly. I don't know. But I also believe you can dissolve all karma when you reach a certain level of consciousness where you now only ever want to do light you no longer fall into those darker places of fear and jealousy greed the seven deadly sins gluttony yeah so you don't you don't fear fall into them anymore so i think i'm pretty sure when you get to that point you're karma dissolves so the moral of the story is oh you just have to be good do good now that's the that's the question then it's like well what's good and what's bad <laughs> right that's there is the an age old question that's probably never been answered because good and there's a great YouTube video with Alan Watts narrating and it's about the Chinese farmer and the farmer you know talks of the ho- he his son finds a holy for horses and everyone the village come around and said oh you found horses and then the next day the son falls off and breaks his leg trying to break in the horse and the villagers come over and say oh they're very bad and and he says possibly and yeah so it happens a few times and and basically you you never know for sure it can turn out bad so like if like I heard a story of (laughs) and I don't know (laughs) it's from Osho so it may not be accurate so he he said that in China many thousands of years ago I'm just getting comfy here yeah in China many thousands of years ago there was a a feud between two men and what and they one man shot the other man with an arrow and it shot into it it went into his leg and was stuck there and that was the end of the few, but afterwards, the man's headaches had stopped. <laughs> and so, this was the invention of acupuncture. <laughs> there was some sort of, someone was like, hey, why is this point here? Sure or not, I don't know, I'm skeptical, but it's, it's more about the moral of the story is that you never know what's good and bad in that long big scheme of things and that's the game we play but i i think what you what you can do though you can have a a good heart and you can be always aiming to bring light to the world like why not why not yeah yeah why not why would you not why would you not see the beauty and joy in this world? Why wouldn't you see the beauty and joy in every human? Why would you want to cause any uh, pain to anybody? Like, there's no no really need for that. If you're not, if you've got, if you're just f- in that state. So, yeah. So sin, missing the target. 
which makes sense because sin missing the target the target is to stay on that path of goodness stay on the path of goodness and it's very interesting because I was never a Christian I was born a Christian uh, Anglican Christian English or Prote Protestant maybe no Anglican and uh, never really had much to do with religion at all my mum never even talked to me about God at all the first time she introduced me to any spirituality was the she said the Celestine Prophecy which was one of books in the maybe in the 80s that came out it was really one of the first spiritual books but I did I read it and I didn't really get it this is when I was about 16 I think but yeah I Christianity didn't have any impact on me like I had the Bible and when my sister passed away I was reading it a phrase every night it was sort of my little ritual and carried it around with me everywhere even if I'd been out drinking <laughs> all night still before bed open this book up to a random page the Bible I should this book the Bible and uh, I would then read a paragraph but a lot of the times I never really understood what it said I was very green in the terms of uh, anything to do with spirituality but I like it I, li I feel fortunate because I was probably one of the few people in the world that didn't in get any indoctrination let's do that leave the mic stand alone <sighs> hang on sorry guys I do like this mic stand doesn't stick to the table too good. Alright, how's that? Alright, I'm just trying to get as comfy as possible with mango on my lap here as well. Ah, uh, what were we talking about? Sin. And then we were talking about something else. I forget now. Christianity. Yeah, so Christianity was something I never really got into. I skipped it. Skipped Christianity and went to Buddhism, yoga, started doing a lot of yoga. And then started reading a lot like all the, all like the Hindu texts, just scanning for everything, trying to work out what the hell what is this spirituality all about? <laughs> really, <laughs> had just no, no contact with anybody, to be honest. And so yeah, self-taught, self-taught all the way. <laughs> Seems to be in everything I've done, self-taught. For some reason, it, it was always me doing it, and not and not really having others that were alongside doing it at the same same space same pace yeah so it was a solo journey and the well it was perfect really because it w the internet sort of started coming in just when I needed it to to be able to find this information and I got a lot listened to a lot of YouTube a lot of audio books a lot of podcasts. Joe Rogan was a big instrumental one. He was the main one, actually. And plant medicines and meditation. A lot of meditation. And then uh, I think the community played a big role in my growth as well. Because I'm coming from a small country town, me and my sister and my mum and my stepfather is really the 
what I remember for most of my life. My stepfather wasn't there that often. And so it was, yeah, and you're just hanging out with your schoolmates and then that's it. You're not really seeing or meeting all new different people all the time. So living in community, and we had a, it was like a traveling community. It was open for anyone who wanted to come and stay for as long as they want. Or for one day, or they could leave and come back. It was sort of like this open house. And because we live in a tourist area in southwest WA, the you're getting lots of travelers from all over the world traveling around here. And so, yeah, we just, I basically opened up my house, <laughs> my farm, to, and I didn't have to go anywhere. And amazing people would come in. You never know, knew who was going to walk in the door. You never knew what vibe was going to be at night time. We had a stage in the, in the communal space so people would get up and play music and had some amazing dances and that just coming from a very quiet background to go into this for a, a year almost two years it very it, it changed all like through winter it was different to summer but yeah it, it it's been a real adventure and it's really open my consciousness like I, I'm a lot more comfortable in myself after the last three years just interacting with people all the time I think maybe I beforehand I was maybe a little bit sh shy to communicate with people I didn't feel conversation as flowing so well I wasn't comfortable in conversation it's probably what it is and just by doing it a lot doing it a lot you um, just get more comfortable same as everything right do it enough and you get you become the master and that really helped with my confidence the last few years and and my knowing of who I am, finding my higher self, and just learning to love myself through all those experiences. That's, that's been the greatest gift, I feel, learning to love yourself. And I still forget to love myself at times. What it is, is when you love yourself, you you don't need anything else. Like when you truly love yourself, everything about you, you just think, wow, you're amazing. And you're grateful for all, all of yourself, all your parts that make up yourself. Yeah, you become grateful. And you love your s you learn to love yourself. And when you love yourself, you don't require love from anywhere else. Like what you require is just you don't need anything. There's no need, and there's no desire. Now, I like to think of it as. mind just dropped time to light a cigarette oh sorry mango just whack mango's head on the mic totally forgot what I was talking about mango what was I talking about viewers there must be a podcast button that you can get where you can just 
hit hit it back for 30 seconds and find out what you were talking about. That would be cool. So that's why I get my excitement about these communities, sustainable villages, because I know that it can be done, and I'm and I know it's been. Done. I guess through my experience, I now am aware that it's possible. I know, and that's what drives me now to wanting to talk about making this happen on a bigger scale building proper communities again is is totally within our reach all the information is now available like we've got just so much technology we've got so much boffins boffins and your village can specialise in a certain type of thing like I the first villages I see, sustainable villages, are the ones that s specialize in healing and holistic uh, healing and consciousness expanding community sustainability. Like, so you have people, specialists, that are, are wanting to raise consciousness. They're wanting to heal people. They want to bring in wisdom to, to the world. So you create these spaces where you have many healers. But you also have people who are creating and ensuring the survival of the community. You have gardeners and you have... So you have all the different modalities. They all come together to create each piece of the jigsaw puzzle. But the core, the glue that holds it all together is the, the family. So, so often in communities, what holds things together is, is the money. The money that people are earning to be able to pay, to afford to be able to stay in that area. But it's not, that's not what it should be about. It should be because you're with your you're a family and you're all s helping to support one another like the uh, I had a, a lady point out to me that if you want to sell community to the world speak to the mothers and when she said that it was just like that light bulb went on because exactly Mothers, they're the ones in our Western world that are so alone and so overburdened by raising children on their own. Without their most most women now are just on their on their own, single mothers. Father dad's working away working away or he's working night shift or he's like it's it's like a w one man band and then dad comes home and mum dad's now just been at work and he's now got to go look after the kids and cuz mum's exhausted like what sort of pressures does that put on our s on our our families where if you look at the in any groups as soon as you've got a group of people and there's kids, the kids all pack off together and they all just, they're off running around and playing and doing their thing. Like instantly, mums are given some space and some time just because there's other kids around. And it doesn't matter the ages, they all just hang out together. They group off into their little groups and their vibrations and off they go. And so suddenly mum has some space. If mum's at home with her kids, with no, no other distractions, 
Like mum has to keep finding things for the kids to do usually. Right? Where you as soon as you bring a bunch of kids together, they're off. They're doing they've found their things to do. They're the greatest explorers. Greatest greatest inventors, children. And greatest yeah, just at imaginations. So like that's one advantage. That's one tiny little advantage, which is such a huge advantage for community, ra- for raising children. Not to think of other benefits, like having other wise people around, other other people that can teach the children, so and can guide them. You know, having more than uh, like just their mum and dad around for influence like that that's massive and it then again it also takes pressure off mum and dad mum and dad get some more space uh, communities could have their own schools will have their own schools so you can find the community that teaches in the right in the way that you you want your children to be taught easier to get them to school because you're all living in the same space they just walk or ride their horse you know um, so it's community based schooling that's another advantage for parents I think you've also got you've got wisdom of the elders, the older, the grandparents, of other parents, like not other grandparents, everyone will be at, will, are they there to offer advice if if so, you so choose. Lots of stories, like you can. You can have babysit having a a babysitter that, that, or many types of babysitters. Like you've got, lots of choice. You've also got other adults to play with the kids, take them on adventures. It's like this, and groups of kids. Everyone's learning, everyone's growing together. And just having that diverse range of influence is is very, very important, which we, in the Western world, we've lost. Like I I tell a story of my, my kids... There's a town in Aug- called Augusta down here, and I took them to the uh, the supermarket, and there was a bus of like really elderly people had come into the supermarket, and I caught my kids l- giggling at each other. I'm like, "What's why are you guys giggling?" And it's because they've they s- there was a really old like you know a ninety plus uh, person. And they were laughing at how they looked because my kids had not been around old people. Like, this is the tragedy. (laughs) Children don't even get to hang out with old people anymore. And even for myself, I don't know that many old people. My, My grandparents have all passed away. But there's so many grandparents who've got no one. So there's this disconnect, and I love old people. I love to talk o- about their stories and their life and their wisdom. You know, they've lived that life. There's so much we can get from it. But yeah, so that's just one advantage of living in a community. But it's a huge one. It's one of the biggest ones. Is the benefits to family when you're living in a community that has the children as the priority like that's that is the another priority you want harmony but you also protect your children and you protect them by educating them you protect them by teaching them the ways of the world and by teaching them the ways of the world is allowing them to experience the world which means to be around people some of the like I remember in grade 7 
we were studying French and I'm like, why do I want to learn French? <laughs> so I didn't. I was like, what's the point? I pro I'd probably never spoken to a French. I don't know. It was just no desire because I didn't see the value of it. But seeing when you, like, all the travelers that come have come through the uh, Mindful Earth and all the different languages spoken, seeing these multilingual Europeans come through and going, oh, I wish I could speak four languages. <laughs> what a what an amazing thing to be out. I'm like, why didn't I should have realized how important it was to ha have more than one language? Didn't even didn't get didn't get that realization till probably at least thirty. That hey, and that was when I started to travel. It's like hey, I need to know more than. I remember it was in Thailand, I was sitting at a dinner table with about 10 people, all European, and they were all talking different German, French, Spanish, English. They were all chopping and changing, and here I'm sitting there just with my English, feeling that I might have <laughs> missed out on something important. <laughs> yeah, but anyway. That's how the Anglos, the Anglophiles, just only have to learn English. Mm. Yeah, so it, you could write a book on the advantages of c living in a community. You really could, and I might have to start putting ideas down. But that that family is the is a huge one. Family, because it, it so much disconnect between families now, and education and parents, even even parents being involved in the schooling. Like at the at the moment, it's. Kid, the parents drop the kids off at school and then pick them up. They don't have any influence or don't really even know what's going on at school. You get to go and see the parent-teach interviews once every s six months and then you ask the kids what they did at school and they don't tell you. So it's like... So, yeah, there are parents that are a lot more involved in the schooling, obviously. But if you had school in your community I'd imagine the parents would be involved in those schools way more like they would be offering to, to, to do cl courses classes on what they know like it, in the past the father would teach the son the arts and it would be handed down so the blacksmith would teach his son to be a blacksmith. The warrior would teach his son to be a warrior. The knight, you know. The so it was. That's why surnames like Smith, I believe, is you know blacksmith. He was the smith of the village, and so he just he just inherited that name. This is probably a good chance if your last name is Smith. You're probably pretty good with your hands, I'm thinking. Yeah. And that, yeah. So, family. Financially is a really interesting one for community. And this is going forwards into the future. Because I feel that the future we're going into, the land or assets that produce something, something that's required, is will be the where the 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 best investment. So obviously, farmland is you know you see all the 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 mega rich buying up farmland at the moment. Because farmland, 
you can d build things on you can have animals you can build a solar farm you can harvest you can plant trees you can do anything so much but not anything but yeah you can do so much on on farmland but if you go and buy a million dollar mansion in in the city like what can that produce what does that produce it doesn't it it's a drain on resources and uses more power than it produces needs more upkeep for no return and so you have to ask yourself what what are the products and services that are going to be of value in the future and for me I see that it'll be this, the commodities that the basic survival commodities like food fuel electricity water internet like these things are all going to be of value and if you but at the moment like the city you're depending on other other people to produce that our the system to, to to stay up and running and i'm more leaning towards now that we've instead of being totally centralized systems so centralized even banking system like we need to create our own little currencies as well we could do that like decentralize is what we need to do now because we have the technology now to be able to decentralize and then that allows us to be creative and create what we want what our little kingdoms want what our little community wants like how do you want to do it if you've got an idea and you want to be like we should be able to we just create these kingdoms communities and the ones that work will be successful and and that's evolution the model that works the best will be learnt over time but you want to try and get that model as good as possible at the start so you have less iterations of change because yeah it does take time you see democracy's taken a couple hundred years to realize some of the flaws over it's taken this many years for the the dark to manipulate and i mean american politics it's hard to know who's actually running the show to over the whole world to be action to be honest but the american system because they prou pride themselves on the people voting democracy allowing everyone to have a vote and elect their duly elected leaders but it seems that those leaders aren't the ones who are actually making the decisions it, and there's rumors of that isn't there of the you know an underground government that you has never been elected but they're in charge like you don't you don't know the like the it's interesting the like the local council here they have a a mayor or president shire president and she gets elected every couple of years but there's also an administrative mayor who's the boss and he's been in that position for years and years so that you get these figurehead mayors come in every couple of years and get voted in or by somebody the administrative the person who knows like the bureaucrat not the politician is running it 
And I wonder if that's the same in the US. You've got these bureaucrats that have just been in positions so long that they know how everything works and they've just got security clearance <laughs> way more than everyone else. They're the bosses. And we elect these leaders that aren't really running aren't running the show and that's a, a flaw hmm. we're going for time. look at that look at that that's an hour on the dot I must uh, must be getting used to my one hour podcast so I did let it I think I probably let 10 minutes in before we got moving got talking So yeah, we've got bureaucrats in charge, it appears. And who are these bureaucrats? We don't know who they are. It's, it's such a, I mean, it seems to work, but there's flaws in the government systems at the moment. I mean, how it's pretty amazing that it works to run a country like Australia. That's pretty cool. Like the social service system is uh, amazing. Dil disability service is amazing, as I understand it. Uh, the hospital systems are amazing in Australia. Like we, we have it very good. You hurt yourself and someone will, they'll fix you. Like they're, they're for me as an Australian, it's they'll fix me for free if it's an emergency. Uh, yeah, the best care in the world. So we've we've done like the system has created some very good things. Like modern medicine has its good parts, but you could also argue that it's also missed a lot of things and maybe that's the same with democracy as it has its good parts but it's missed a lot of things and what are the reasons for that short term elect like short term leaders electing leaders that aren't really the right leaders good politicians maybe not good leaders What else would there be? I I have a f I feel that the the short termness of elections and then if you only get if you're getting reelected every four years, then what that means is after three, so you probably spend you get elected take a year to get into the swing of how things work, and then you got two years to be able to do things which I would imagine things happen pretty slowly and then the the fourth year you're on the election campaign again so it's this continual cycle of and of leaders and maybe we're better off having a w good leader who's there for a good time amount of time you see the president of Singapore. He's been in a democratically elected country for the last... I think he's been ruling for over 40 years, 30, 40 years. And I believe he's done a pretty good job in Singapore. It's pretty, pretty cool city, beautiful city. They're, they're really building beautiful buildings in Singapore. Like it's It's the airport uh, it just uh, and having that stability for the a leader has helped with that immensely hmm you could say Putin I don't know how long he's been in around 10 years 20 years in Russia 
Well, everyone, him as a leader for Russia, it would take a couple of years to get into the swing of how everything works and, and improve. But if he's dedicated because that he loves that role and he wants t- he's doing it for the people, then why would you change somebody? And that's that's the I guess that's where the democratic system came in because if someone's doing a bad job, you only, at least you only got them for four years. Or a dictator, you've got them for way too much longer. And I. I th- I think in the past the way it worked with kings and queens or dictators is they just wouldn't last. Eventually they'd get booted. Someone would overthrow them. That was how it worked. If if a king or queen lost the will of God, who lost their heart, then didn't take long before they were replaced and I guess the problem is is the good hearted kings and queens were also replaced by not kind people you look at JFK I know only a little bit about him but he impacted many many people and he generally had seemed to have a pretty good He was a considerate guy. He had his heart in the right place. And he I heard his speech on secret societies the other day. He was warning us about something. Secret societies, which is sort of back to what I was talking about, the US government. You don't really know who's running the show which is the most dangerous thing if you don't know they can get away with everything and they can blame everyone and they can like so that w- you would uh, hope that s- nothing like that is actually ha- happening in our western world but yeah leaders leaders long term leaders look at the kings and queens they would have been sorry they were like ruling for 20 30 40 60 years i think i saw the longest reign would it be 80 years for a king and then you go back to the sumerian and the babylonians and and even the egyptians they've got they've got stories of their on their kings lists like the kings living for a thousand two thousand years and maybe that's how they they were in those in the ancient days when they had everything dialed in a lot more where they had a spirit like i believe when you reach this a certain spiritual evolution you don't age the same way and I heard a uh, someone say, maybe Wayne Dyer. He said, uh, "If you s- if you're in the present moment, then you don't you're not in time. You're not in the future. You're not in the past. You're not worrying about the future. You're not desiring something from the past or the future. That you're just in this moment." And you don't age. So I like that. I was like, yeah, okay. I like it. Just stay in the present moment and you'll stay the same age. Sort of makes sense. Let's see how if that works. I think it's another key thing for aging is just general positive mindset. Feeling good all the time, like vibrating at a high vibration. Not allowing your mind to take you away on wild goose chases or to stress or to see a snake in every bush. Like 
not because th- there's no doubt if you see a snake or you see a piece of rope on the on the path you're releasing the same chemicals which are that, that flight or fight mode which put you under stress more stress the body which it needs to because you've got to go and protect you've got to survive right now so you're going to squirt yourself with heaps of good chemicals that make you run fast but yeah if you're thinking of snakes all day long every day that's not it's not good for your body so mental mental state of mind is very important for aging and I even believe if you you see some people that have just got these such young faces and they're in their 40s and you know they've had a tough life they've been through shit they still got their childlike face and I age youth is also here feeling like a child again we tend to <coughs> oh I, I went through a stage where I, w- I didn't it didn't matter about my age <coughs> and when I when I say that I mean because I believe that if I say I'm 60 hello mango then I've got this idea in my head of what a 60 year old looks like of what a 60 year old behaves like and so I get to 60 and then I s- just even subconsciously start slowing down I start complaining and I start you know s- everything's heavier <laughs> right that that is our programming when you get to 80 oh I must be getting close to death like these are so we need to scrub those belief systems for one that's the first step I'm going for 300 it was 120 for a while but I'm going for 300 now I reckon by being in a positive state of mind being in the now not stressing not worrying about what age you are that'll get you a long way in your extension of life and obviously you want to have an extension of life where you've still got all your faculties you can still make love (laughs) to me that if you run out if you can't make love anymore then hmm, I guess the but that would be my prerequisite to be to be healthy and fit enough to be able to make love play go for a run but yeah it's fit top of your game still so not not 80 and near death can't move in your bed can't hear can't see got dementia no thank you so yeah anti-aging techniques it's all a state of mind food would definitely play a role good foods probably life rich foods that have taken in the sun holding that sun's energy in the food with all its good with other earth nutrients mixed in yeah that life hacks for body for performance spiritual and physical performance to me that's what that the journey of the spiritual being is looking for life hacks to make life more amazing and there's spiritual and physical hacks that you can do for one I'll give you a life hack that I was experimenting with recently was having a siesta in the afternoon it was awesome I, d- I set my alarm at 2 every hour <laughs> every p- 2 p.m. every afternoon and for a while I was 
without fail going from my sleep at two. But then I was staying up until one or two at night, midnight, past midnight. Get up and I get up at six in the morning and it worked really well. And like two is the quiet time, not much happening. People are also having siestas or they're off out to the beach or so like I found like night time I needed to be around and I it was great to be around because good music and, and then morning time was also busy with lots of conversations and things happening so to not miss out on the night because what I was doing was getting up early and going to bed early but you throw a siesta in there and suddenly you can do both so there's a life hack that I found quite nice and I'm like I want to go to Spain and get into some siesta living I think it's the way <laughs> alright I think that in solar eclipses tomorrow 20th of April I don't know what time it is but it's in only in Exmouth it crosses the Exmouth coast that little point that bit of land that jots out and it's a pretty sure it's a total solar eclipse at the first one for the year and I really feel like it's a significant astrological event especially with what's happening in the world and all these revelations and yeah we're living living in amazing times and for this eclipse that's going to happen tomorrow and then starship spacex's starship is launching tomorrow night to watch as well i've been following that and yeah amazing times peoples And we still need to get out and do a worldwide peace movement. <laughs> we need to get everyone, every human on the planet.